Um, all, all right, well, if, if we're ready, um, let's uh, get started. Allow me to introduce uh, David Henderson. David Henderson is the Robert R. Chambers Distinguished Professor of Philosophy at the University of Nebraska. He works primarily in epistemology. And today he's gonna be giving a paper co-authored with Terry Horgan called Epistemic Social Norms and Testimonial Belief. So join me in welcoming uh, David Henderson. Thanks guys. Um, I'm actually still having trouble getting this thing to show me the damn participant window. Uh, uh, if, let's see, so if you, if you uh, click on, do you have the participant box at the bottom? If you click on that, it, it should turn green. Yes, uh, oh. it, I don't have it there. Okay. Um, um, let's see. Uh, well, if you want, hmm. Maybe because you're sharing your screen. If you, yeah, it, it fights yeah. me on it when I'm sharing the screen. Yeah. Yeah, why don't you stop sharing for a second and then... Uh, yeah, I'll do that. That seems the most sensible thing to do. There it is. Okay. Uh, and we have one waiting, and I will admit such person. Okay. Uh, and... Uh, All right, and... Uh, maybe I'll leave it like that. This uh, screen looks fine to you guys, I take it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so... Uh, uh, well, we can't see the uh, screen. Are you sharing your screen? Oh, I need to share it again. Thanks. You can see how uh, on top of things I am. Uh, there. That should work fine. Okay. So uh, I'm going to first apologize. It's a great way to start a talk. Uh, I have too many slides and they're too busy and I'll try to gloss over them uh, as best I can. Uh, let me explain the crediting, uh, David Henderson with Terry Horgan. I wrote this paper over a year ago uh, and uh, Terry, when visiting, uh, had some uh, comments and so it benefited from those comments, but additionally, we thought this was probably better pursued as a book project. So what you're getting is a presentation related to a paper that's really the sketch uh, or the ideas for a book project. Um, okay, so uh, what are the ideas? Um, here's three lines of thought that I wanted to bring together. One is to take a position on reduction versus anti-reduction in the epistemology of testimony. Uh, often um, certain epistemic channels, uh, processes, uh, sources are um, thought to either be irreducible uh, or um, subject to reduction, but we got to figure out what the reduction is examples are testimony, perception, memory. Reductionism, which as I'm understanding it, is the thesis that objective justification for such beliefs, uh, the objective justification is different in kind from, uh, you know, uh, I'm sorry. Um, yes, that the objective justification for such beliefs is different in kind from that appropriate to other um, channels. So, um, but here you want to distinguish two things. Uh, there's the idea of reducing testimony or perception to something else. So with respect to testimony, you could imagine a position, a kind of cartoon of an empiricist position in which um, what you were going to do is uh, reduce um, your objective justification for receiving testimony, adopting a belief on the basis of testimony, to, for example, some generalization regarding the reliability of testimonial sources, where that generalization would be derived from, uh, say, a range of 
uh, perceptions of past instances. So that would be reducing testimony to some other modality. Uh, that's not so much what we have in mind. Uh, the, al the alternative would be reduction to a common form. And here the idea is that perhaps testimony, perceptual beliefs, uh, various kinds of theoretical belief formation would all be understood in terms of um, some kind of general epistemic process, perhaps one that has coherence theoretic elements. Uh, and so um, that's closer to what uh, we have in mind. Uh, reductionism then is the idea that the objective justificatory, objective justification or warrant for all manner of beliefs turns on wider evidential support. So there, um, even in perceptual cases, but in testimonial cases, you may, as a competent agent, be responsive to background that is informative of um, the kind of perceptual situation you're in and the reliability of your processes there. It doesn't, so, uh, so the wider evidential support would bear on the degree of reliability. Uh, what's at issue here is whether or not there's, for objective justification, something in the, uh, on the order of positive support in at least the background that is in play in the competent reception of testimony. Uh, and it's worth noting that this does not require support from beliefs of a wholly different sort. So quite plausibly, uh, with all sorts of beliefs, testimony could be important uh, as a part of the background or beliefs gotten by testimony could be important as a part of the background uh, to which you're responsive. So we want to think about reductionism and support a kind of reductionism. At the same time, we want to pull on certain ideas about epistemic norms. And here, I want to draw on work in the philosophy of social science to think about uh, normative understandings and how, how they rightly inform our uh, cooperative and coordinated epistemic practice. Um, so, uh, I want to talk about how uh, conformity to these epistemic norms or these social sensi uh, normative sensibilities is commonly conditioned by epistemically proper expectations in the background. Uh, and the in the background part is meant to be um, understood in terms of ideas that uh, John Tienson and Harry and, and Terry Horgan uh, originally developed and from which I have benefited um, a great deal. So that's the third idea that a kind of iceberg epistemology. Uh, so this is the idea that there's an important kind of monitoring that's just commonly already in place in competent agents in which background information is automatically accommodated. Um, and so those are the three ideas that I wanted to talk about. So let's say a little bit more about the reductionism and anti-reductionism. Uh, so at issue here is the question of whether epistemic warrant or objective just doxastic justification for testimonial beliefs is fundamentally different in nature from the kind of justification that accrues to beliefs of most other kinds. Um, you could see that as related to the question whether testimonial beliefs have a kind of basic belief status. Um, our view is uh, a reductionism, but a reductionism of a nuanced sort. Uh, after all, what kinds of cognitive processes are fitting in the formation of beliefs generally? So we'll want to say something about that. But it's a reduction, reductionism that nevertheless feels like anti-reductionism 
and that's the result of the iceberg epistemology. So what you are most struck by is the limits to the amount of attention often given. Two questions of reliability as you take on trust from others, uh, testimony, and the idea is that that limit of what's articulate is the limits of the above the waterline aspects of our cognitive processes where much is going on below the surface in the automatic accommodation of information. So anti-reductionism uh, supports a kind of defeasible insular epistemic entitlement. This is to say that one can be objectively justified in forming a testimonial belief without having positive evidence, certifying in any degree that one's testimonial source and the testimony received is reliable. And thus without having in play cognitive processes that are sensitive to such an evidential background. So it's the idea that one is entitled to accept as true what is presented as true, at least as a default, and that that um, entitlement doesn't depend upon background. Um, now, even for the anti-reductionist, this defeasible, I'm sorry, this default status is defeasible, so that if you happen to possess evidence, evidence against the reliability of the testimonial source, uh, that entitlement is defeated and the agent must sensitively respond to the balance of possessed evidence bearing on the reliability in the circumstances. But this kind of view kind of leaves you in a kind of funny position, one in which uh, you're fine to just be proceeding along. Uh, and if you have evidence, you have to bring that up. Evidence uh, that detracts from the reason to think reliable, or, but you needn't have had reasons in the first place. Uh, and so you could say, well, when I'm running along without processes that are sensitive to reliability, how is it that I manage to call in place uh, processes that would make it evident to me that I, the default um, entitlement was defeated and caused me to do more. And it looks like then you need processes in play that's responsive to the balance or the background evidence. And I take it that that is indeed the view uh, to which we are given. Uh, so, the reductionism then says that testimonial belief is epistemically justified only if the believer possesses adequate positive evidence favoring the reliability of the testimonial source where the relevant evidential support would be of sorts that are required for warrant had by other forms of belief and that a responsiveness to such background support is fitting to the formation and maintenance of all forms of belief perceptual, inductive, abductive, and testimonial belief. So these are not different in that regard. Uh, well, so the idea is that, an idea that's gonna be important for us is that of monitoring. The justified formation of testimonial belief is fittingly conditioned by a kind of monitoring that is sensitive to cues and to both general and situation specific expectations uh, regarding interlocutor reliability. Agents can and should draw on rich justified expectations that have arisen in the course of ongoing experience in the community. Now that may seem to ask for a lot. I'm wanting to convince you that what it's asking for is fairly tractable uh, when properly understood. So, for one thing, such monitoring is compatible with trust and interpersonal reliance on others. Anti-reductionists commonly emphasize the place of trusting reliance on others. We acknowledge the importance of a kind of trust, 
one that's associated with shared normative sensibilities and interpersonal relationships. Uh, and we argue that there's no conflict on this score, that trust is often embedded in a, a range of more or less deep or surface uh, relationships for which competent agents have acquired much in the way of expectations. So central here is going to be this idea of epistemic norms, including those for the giving and receiving of testimony. Uh, these are widely shared normative sensibilities, and they are operative against the background of expectations that have themselves arisen out of much evidential background. So um, that's why instead of an evidentially insular embedded entitlement, we want an evidentially embedded entitlement. Um, so while in receiving testimony, one need not articulate the background expectations bearing on one's trust or reliance on one source, yet such background is commonly accommodated in an informed trust. So what we are most interested in, I think, is the way these expect, way, the way we generate and respond to these expectations and how those expectations come to possess strong epistemic justification as humans engage with uh, one another over time in a community. Um, So contrary to anti-reductionism, this entitlement is grounded in positive evidence. That is to say evidence for the epistemically justified general expectation of testimonial reliability and often evidence bearing on the justified more delimited expectations for reliability in certain contexts in certain communities in connection with certain uh, differentiated roles in an epistemic community. Um, and yet it's commonly accommodated below the surface. Uh, so in thinking about this, I wanted to draw on a useful typology I get from Christina Bicchieri. Um, I guess it's the grammar of society and norms in the wild, two uh, lovely books that I recommend uh, to people, as well as much of her work that has a significant empirical dimension to it um, and reflects um, the nuanced ways in which expectations are situationally called into play in different social settings and also the kinds of choice situations that agents are facing in connection with their normative sensibilities. So what the normative sensibilities are doing for you. For our purposes, we could at least mention three kinds of normative sensibilities that seem relevant. Uh, one is what Christina Bicchieri calls customs. So these respond to choice situations in which the costs and rewards of choices accrue to the individual agent in a way that's largely independent of the choices of others. So a common example is I may learn to make bows and arrows. I don't know why this is such a popular example, but uh, there's a certain technology. It's a technology that's uh, on evidence in my social community. Uh, we notice the differential success of some and very quickly we largely find ourselves making bows and arrows in similar, very similar ways. Uh, but I'm supposing that the bow and arrow is then employed in individual hunting. And so the effect of the bow and arrow largely accrues to the individual making it. So here, and we're, we could set aside food sharing norms and things like that. So now all we have to do is figure out, I have to figure out, you have to figure out how to make bows and arrows effectively. And we pay attention to success rates, but we also very quickly glom on to a kind of normative sensibility about how it is done and how it is to be done that we uh, that becomes a kind of common thing in the group. That's why it's called a custom. Uh, uh, Joe Henrich 
Um, well, Boyd talk about um, a cultural ratchet, okay, where this normative sensibility is responsive to success in the group, but it becomes a commonly individually motivated practice. Other normative sensibilities have to do with choice situations where coordination or cooperation become important. These are ones in which what I get from my choice and what you get from your choice depends upon the choices made by others. Uh, in some of these, we talk about coordination games. These are games where uh, what we need to do is kind of get on the same page. Once we're on the same page, we're all happy because we all get the advantage of that coordination. A simple example of that is which side of the road to drive on. Once we've all settled on the right side of the road, no one really except perhaps Tom Waits has a temptation to defect from that equilibrium. Uh, if we decided instead on the left side of the road, well then no one would have a temptation to defect. So you have two multiply good, two equally good equilibria and the problem is getting onto the same page. Certain kinds of epistemic situations do have in a limited way this character. So it may be that we need to distribute our epistemic labor and what we need as a way of distributing that labor. But once we've got it distributed in some kind of equitable and effective way, we have an equilibrium, which you wouldn't generally have a reason to defect on. I'm gonna take that back in a second, but It'll be obvious why I would. The other kind of social choice situation is a cooperation game. In a cooperation game, there are what are called mixed motives. So I have a tint. I may uh, have a reason to uh, conform to a certain normative sensibility, uh, provided you do. But I also may have a temptation not to. Let's see, I, um, let me see. I'm, I'm gonna come back to that at least, maybe in this slide. Um, well, let me, <laughs> let me go back one. I'll say something about it. Maybe I can skip a slide later. Uh, Think of a public goods game. In a public goods game, we may suppose that each of those of us in this group uh, have uh, a chance to donate between one and $10 to a pool. The results of that, uh, those contributions will be multiplied and multiplied at a rate where each of us gets 20 cents for every dollar. Each of us gets 20 cents for every dollar contributed. If we all kicked in a dollar, I'm guessing, well, let's just say there are 10 of us, then we'd end up getting $2 back from our $1 contributions, each of us. Uh, if we all kicked in $10, uh, we'd all get back $20, and that's pretty nice. There's a public good that's now distributing. We all are better off. But there's also the problem that uh, there's a temptation to free ride because if if we were to, if you all can kicked in, let's say there are again 10 of us, if you all kicked in uh, $10, uh, we'd all give back $18. If I didn't contribute, I'd have my 10, I now have $28 and I come out ahead. And for any any contributions that you make, I come out better by free riding, okay? Now, when, when is something like this, for something like this to be the case epistemically, it has to be the case that uh, once in a while, we feel like we would do a better uh, slacken. Now that can happen, not so much epistemically. I won't be better off epistemically, but I might have concerns other than epistemic. So for example, uh, I may want to go see, uh, the St. Louis Cardinals uh, on a given afternoon. And I know I have a presentation coming up. And uh, so I'm kind of tempted, tempted to cut slack, make up, try to be more 
authoritative than I feel like I really am. Uh, and in doing that, I'm both dissembling to you, deceiving you. I'm also often putting across things in a way that uh, that is not epistemically toward for me or you. But I'm doing it because I come out ahead by enjoying the afternoon uh, at a ballpark that sometime will be open again. Uh, so, uh, so the epistemic situation in a community can confront us with mixed motive games. And um, when do we conform to these norms of these various sorts? Um, well, what's notable is that particularly for coordination and cooper cooperation games, humans manage to cooperate con more or less consistently, but do so by virtue of coming to understand both certain shared rules, the way it is to be done, uh, and by coming to have an associated range of expectations for the choices and evaluations of others. Uh, so um, we want to focus now on the expectations that are pivotal in people's conformity. Obviously, the idea here is that these expectations are going to be something we have in play and in place as we interact with each other um, in our everyday and professional uh, epistemic communities. Uh, so in a coordination game, agents want and need to jointly settle on one Nash equilibrium. Uh, and conformity is going to be a function of understanding the rule. Uh, we prefer to talk of normative expect. A normative sensibilities, but that's because we wonder about whether a uh, rule makes it too clear that you mix, suggest that you can articulate the how it is to be done in any robust sense. Uh, in any case, conformity will be a function of understanding a rule and having expectations for general conformity for others for the rule. So sometimes doing our part in a distributed practice would depend upon having expectations uh, of others doing their part in that distributed practice where doing their part is a matter of conforming to certain normative expectations, uh, either about producing beliefs or about communicating beliefs uh, produced. Uh, Bicchieri talks about these kinds of uh, descriptive expectations for others' practice as empirical expectations, and we think that's an important part of our epistemic life together. Uh, but when you have mixed motives, something more is needed, and that something more uh, is something that overcomes the temptations, or at least often overcomes the temptation to defect or to cut corners in your epistemic practice, or not to appear to know more than you do, and things like that. So to overcome this temptation and to maintain conformity with the rule at the level at which the empirical expectations are also maintained over time, agents' preferences for conforming to the rule commonly will need to be conditioned by a second set of expectations, which Bikieri describes or terms normative expectations. These are expectations regarding other agents' normative and evaluative responses to conformity or failures of conformity. They include things like gossiping about the idiot in the White House uh, or gossiping about the failure to maintain scientific norms in certain uh, committees. Uh, or if we really manage to do what we ought, marginalize certain epistemic agents in our epistemic community as a fallout of the gossip. And um, I must say, I think Bikieri has a, a, and I, I like some classic experiments by um, Cialdini uh, that have to do with the ways in which our practices are often subtly conditioned by these expectation and cues that 
characterize those expectations or call into play those expectations. Okay, so um, I'm interested in the acquisition of uh, rules and, um, and the normative and empirical expectations. So early and ongoing people are acutely sensitive to whether others are conforming to the norms that they have learned or are learning. Human agents are quick to generate a rule or normative sensibility from observed practice. They do so even uh, when there's not a fallout for others for that practice, but they're more sensitive even when there is a normative fallout or a, a uh, fallout with respect to the payoffs of others who are involved in that community practice. Uh, so as Tomasello and collaborators have noted, uh, in a set of systematic studies, human epistemic agents are very quick to latch on to something demonstrated to them. Even if it's not generated in normative terms, they generalize the observed practice into a rule and they pay attention to when others do and do not conform to the practice as understood. Again, human, the human cognitive critter seems to be set up evolutionarily and thus psychologically to key on observed practice and formulating an understanding, uh, formulating an understanding that is both empirically, empirical, descriptive of the regularity of the practice and also rule-like. So um, when my talk of this understanding with its descriptive and normative faces as an understanding of how it is to be, done. And so I like that formulation. Uh, let's see. I guess I'm taking too long. So happily, I'm going to skip uh, a bunch here. Uh, so let's see. So an upshot of being in a society in which such descriptive norms and uh, I've been talking about both descriptive and um, and uh, social in Beaky area since norms dealing with both those kinds of choice situations. So let's just say an upshot of being in a society in which such norms are operative is a pervasive and intimate intertwining of customs for state-of-the-art belief fixation and norms for a division of labor and for sharing one's aptly formed beliefs and of paying the cost of quality inquiry and not communicating less than what you got by qualitative inquiry. And if you have a sense, well, I'm not sure that's always done, you are right. It isn't always done. And I suggest that you are quite sensitive to that. Uh, and you're sensitive in part because you have both descriptive expectations and normative expectations all at work in you all the time automatically. Um, so such norms of belief would not only allow but also strongly prescribe substantial reliance on testimony. After all, we want distributed labor in our epistemic community. And there would be significant quality control in place norms for the dissemination of information about sources and stocks of information. That is, if you don't gossip about the idiot in the White House, you are shirking your duty. Um, and I, I think we appreciate that. Uh, and norms for reliance on testimony under circumstances where various, I'm sorry, norms prescribing the reliance on testimony in sources where various what I would call warning flags are present. And the idea of warning flags here is the idea that the processes in the background that are responsive to both these expectations and cues often throw up concerns uh, at places and often don't throw up concerns at other places. And what I wanted to notice that you're beginning to see an imperfect parallel with the entitlement structure that's dear to the anti-reductionists, but it's one that we think is um, rooted in a 
appropriate kind of ongoing monitoring in the background. Um, I'm going to um, maybe skip a bit. I take it the one does appreciate that um, people vary in a range of ways, general ways. Uh, in part, it's known because people talk about others. In part, it's known because you notice sometimes when you examine somebody that they haven't done, <coughs> as it were, due diligence. Uh, so that in the course of this experience that you've had since you were, I'm guessing, one and a half or two, uh, with increasing development, with increasing nuance, uh, you refine your understanding of the norms. You inform um, these in on the in this context. You get a um, in information about the extent of conformity to the norms and the variable extent of conformity, uh, and you get some sense of who you can trust uh, and uh, to what extent on what matters. Um, now, sadly, we're pretty flawed critters, as well as being very interesting critters. And so I had to mention an important caution, because distortions of information about sources can make for epistemic injustice of the sort that uh, Miranda Fricker has um, emphasized to us, and significant harm in the distribution of reliable belief. So epistemic injustice is both a uh, personal harm to others, marginalizing them in our epistemic community, and a social harm to us all, uh, marginalizing good agents in an epistemic community. Uh, you know, uh, Let's see, how, how long have I been talking? I've lost track of when I started. Do I still have some time or should I shut up? Um, so you started at 3.45 and it is now 4.30, so about uh, hour I and I think I talked too long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks. You could just cut to the chase and tell me. Uh, so, uh, all I, all I want to do then is suppose that uh, much of this monitoring can be managed, in fact, is managed in an iceberg fashion where um, because of the, the kind of um, ways in which we as a cognitive system seem to be able to be responsive to much responsibly acquired information without needing to articulate it all the time. Um, we can um, manage to have an entitlement uh, of the sort described by the anti-reductionists while Ultimately, when you think about the full ranges of cognitive processes by which we manage this all, uh, it looks like something that a reductionist should love. And then I shut up. So. All, all right. Uh, see, thank you very much. And um, so if, See, oh, let me turn my video on here. Uh, David, if you could um, transfer the hosting back to me. Uh, I think I did. Excellent, thank you. Um, our video is still off. Okay, so um, next, um, Bronwyn will be giving her uh, comments and I did attach as a file uh, the handout for this. And so that'll be followed by a response from 
uh, David, and then we will go to questions. Um, great. I also, yeah, so I'm going to be um, quoting uh, the paper a bit. So it might be useful for folks to look at the handout if they want to. Um, otherwise, I do have, um, I can always screen share the text at some point, um, but I don't need it now, I guess. Um, okay, thanks. Um, so I found this paper very illuminating. Um, I, I am certainly, certainly, um, uh, whatever the, uh, a novice, whatever's below a novice in this material, I'm not an expert in this material. Um, and insofar as I knew um, anything about uh, the reductionist anti-reductionist debate, it was, con it's always been construed in this, um, the reductive way um, that um, David characterized at the beginning as being um, about yeah, justificatory sources redu reduction of testimonial belief to uh, perceptual um, perceptual justification. So, um, so my comments will be brief, and they will be um, I expect very surface level. Um, but sometimes you know that can be good. So um, hopefully y'all get something about this, and it should be fruit for discussion. Um, so the, briefly what I wanted to ask um, was to question the need for um, the category of testimonial belief or, uh, on this account. So um, on this account, um, reduction and, reductionism about testimonial belief um, is the view that just like other forms of belief, uh, a testimony belief requires positive evidential support in order to be justified. And the concern here, um, characterized here, um, the motivation for anti-reductionism is that this sort of reduction leaves out the role for a trusting reliance on others. That is, there's a kind of trust, um, or so socially uh, uh, conditioning aspect to, um, that's integral to or characteristic of the formation, formation of a justified belief. Uh, so through consideration of the role of epistemic social norms and the evidentially embedded entitlements upon which such norms operate, um, David and Terry, uh, their account, um, as in uh, David's slides, uh, he, he characterizes this account as reductionist insofar as it links the formation of testimonial beliefs with the kinds of cognitive processes um, that are fitting to the formation of beliefs generally. But this account also feels anti-reductionalist uh, insofar as it, it is compatible um, with um, testimonies as um, involving testimonial belief, a justified testimonial belief as involving trust and interpersonal reliance on others. Um, so again, importantly, this reduction, um, it's not that um, testimonial justification is reduced to other sources. Um, it, would, uh, it is rather this reduction um, involves um, a reduction to uh, parallel doxistic justificatory processes. And I, reduction to is the wrong way of saying that. But basically, the idea here is that testimonial belief involves cognitive processes um, that are the same as other. Uh, just uh, other formation of beliefs generally. Um, so what I'm wondering, as I said, is maybe indeed likely very naively, um, what, if anything, on this view, on the non-source um, reduction view, is distinctive about testimonial belief um, as a form of belief. So does this view see a need for or want to um, individuate um, testimonial belief as a distinctive form of belief. So what I've gleaned from the paper um, and from my very limited knowledge of the material is that um, one wants to say that, well, testimonial belief involves a trust um, or inter interpersonal reliance on others. Uh, 
It seems to be integral to the epistemic division of labor, labor um, and is formed on the basis of situation specific expectations that a community member is a reliable source. A source of what? A source of testimony of, of a particular sort of evidence, testimonial evidence. So the first thing I want to um, ask is like, what, what is the testimonial evidence? Um, so do we want, for example, to separate out the norms and expectations surrounding the use of speech in general um, from the norms and expectations surround, surrounding testimony? Uh, what are the motivations for, if there are any, for counting, um, for not counting just any linguistic evidence as testimonial evidence? Um, so this is the you know, idea that not all sayings are tellings, perhaps. Um, but of course, sayings do give us evidence. Um, so we might think even, um, so uh, implicature um, is one example. If I utter, she, uh, she uttered sounds reminiscent of singing. If I say that, um, you might form the belief that the person I'm talking about is a bad singer. Um, now, did I, is that testimonial evidence? Seems maybe not. Um, or presupposition would also um, maybe be an example here. So um, if I say you should meet my dogs, you might form the belief that I have dogs. Um, again, um, I'm not sure if we want to count this as testimonial evidence, but maybe we do. Um, so if you don't like, if you want to separate out um, saying from telling that not all sayings are tellings, um, you might think that or argue that testimony involves not merely saying, um, it involves telling, as I just said, but telling here is an expression of a teller's belief. Um, but of course, then that's not right, because lots of our social behaviors, linguistic and otherwise, are evidence um, of our beliefs, um, but they're also not testimony. Um, so another idea is perhaps testimony evidence involves not merely an expression of a belief, um, but also a trust in the belief formation process or rationality of the source of that testimony. So on this view, it's something like, um, I tell you something and this telling um, you, you on the basis of this telling you form a belief. Um, but the reason uh, and the reason that it's testimony and not these other forms of languagey um, evidence um, or behavioral evidence is that you um, take me to be um, rational in my formation of my beliefs that I've just expressed in words to you. But then, as I was thinking about this, I mean, then if you prefer this sort of characterization, I'm wondering if it then ends up threatening maybe the spirit of anti-reductionism. So because of course, as construed here, it seeks to make something of the element of social trust operative and testimonial belief. But if you really want to lean in on um, the reason for counting a certain um, belief as a testimonial belief, um, uh, because it involves um, an expression of a belief um, that uh, is uh, also accompanied by an expectation of an agent's rationality, um, it's less obvious that that feature, that expectation, relies on social norms or trust. Um, so this is all by way of saying and getting to my question is wondering whether um, on this account um, you want to and need to or motivated to um, maintain that testimony actually is um, a I shouldn't say actually is, I don't know, but if you, um, the, the reasons for maintaining that testimonial belief is a distinct form of belief, uh, given that um, 
just your overall framework um, as, as I saw here, didn't have a, wasn't a, so much interested in kind of enumerating the, the, the basic or sui generis um, uh, uh, justificatory sources um, in the way that other, other reductionist views are. Um, okay, so that uh, is my one main question, but then, um, so I, I hope this is okay. I, I asked Dave and he thought, and he acquiesced, but part of the paper that he didn't talk about was this, the synchronic aspect, the phenomenological aspect um, of this account. Um, and so, can I share? my screen no hmm. are you the host Bronwyn I am oh um oh there we go okay that, that works um so if you want to scroll up um uh, yeah I just need the bottom okay so um so part of this paper I'm just going to read about this notion of confident familiarity. Um, so confident familiarity is the synchronic experiential signature of diachronically possessed evidence for a generalized testimonial expectation. Okay, so I'm gonna read the following passage. You can read it along. Right, so another important fact about internalized general expectations of testimonial reliability is this. Normally, when a situation-specific expectation of a given individual's testimony, to testimonial reliability arises on the basis of general expectation to which it conforms, this short-term expectation is accompanied by a distinctive phenomenological aspect of confident familiarity. One experiences the specific expectation as belonging to a kind that is familiar as a kind, a kind of mental state that one has found oneself in numerous times before, whether or not one currently recalls any particular such past situation, and that typically has led to an accurate testimonial belief. This confident familiarity aspect is a synchronic experiential signature of an underlying general expectation of testimonial reliability that has been instilled diachronically in a highly evidence-responsive evidence manner. So when I read this, I thought it was super interesting, and I started thinking about um, truthiness and um, common sense and um, thinking about, well, like, you know, right, I think Elijah Chudnoff has this example of a gold, gold box conjecture seeming, seeming true, but of course, or seeming like, so this is what popped in my head, but of course, uh, wonderfully, there was this footnote that was in incredibly um, uh, uh, titillating. So I just wanted to bring it up in case people wanted to discuss it because, um, because the authors in the paper re remain neutral, but we have the authors here. Okay, so um, question. Is the feeling of confident familiarity enough to justify an expectation of testimonial reliability, or does it need to have actually arisen through a history of evidence responsive diachronic inst instilling and refinement? Okay, so here we have footnote. Quote, consider a thought experiment, a thought ex the thought experiment mental creature Swamp Man who actually came into existence five minutes ago and is an exact duplicate of a normal human being. When Swamp Man encounters a human interlocutor and forms the situation specific expectation that this person is a reliable source of testimony on a given topic, does the fact that this specific expectation uh, has an, the aspect of a confident familiarity constitute by itself adequate evidential justification for Swatman's underlying general expectation of testimonial reliability? Might it even be the case that the evaluative notion of epistemic justification is context sensitive in such a way that the answer to the question is yes under one potential contextual parameter and no under another potential contextual parameter. In the present paper, we remain neutral on, um, on such matters. Um, so I 
we don't have to, you don't have to address that if there's other questions about uh, the content of the presentation. But I just, given that we've been talking so much about um, phenomenology, I just thought that I had to, and, and given my, um, my limited uh, commenting, I just thought I'd uh, wanted to put that out there because I found it compelling and I really, I, I can't, I, I'd like to see why you're neutral on that basically because one, one answer seems much more um, ob not obvious, intuitive to me than the other, but I'll, um, I'll leave it at that. Thanks very much. All right, uh, thank you very much. Uh, if it's okay, I'm gonna stop sharing this screen just to uh, get back to all your big faces. And uh, so David will comment and then we'll open it up for questions. Again, just send me a private chat message if you uh, have a question. Yes, yes. Uh, first I wanna thank Bronwyn. Uh, I've really appreciated the comments. I thought they were helpful um, and helpful in pushing us in certain ways. Uh, the first thing I, well, first I wanted to say that one of the ways that she was very helpful uh, was to make evident aspects of the paper that I didn't touch on, and they were aspects of the paper that might be most interesting to many of, of you, uh, given your phenomenology stuff. Uh, and so thanks, uh, uh, Brazilian for that. Uh, the, the thing I wanted to emphasize was um, that uh, trust, whatever its uh, normative dimensions, is intimately associated with uh, descriptive and normative expectations of the sort Bicchieri makes evident in this sort that we can all appreciate that we acquire and that any reflection phenomenological on specific diversity of cases in which we find ourselves will reflect that sensitivity to um, much information uh, and the different ways that aspects of it um, become salient for us. And in doing that, I, I think we make a significant case for a a nuance of uh, reductionism. Uh, but um, yeah, so uh, maybe Terry wants to say something, but I, I do think that uh, to my mind, you are right, uh, that the, maybe we were particularly um, reticent. Uh, maybe it was because we were thinking of it at a point as being a book project that we were maybe flagging an issue and not pursuing. But I also feel like the Swamp Man example is one where I'd want to say, uh, if, uh, put it this way, depending on how effective, how, risk, how epistemically appropriately my uh, sensibilities have developed. Uh, I, it's hard for me to hold it against Swamp Man uh, because there's a sense in which Swamp Man has what I think of as an epistemic competence to engage with, and then I don't quite know how to think about the information. I think many of you would like to think about it as a phenomenological uh, uh, content uh, that Swamp Man has that is great and bracket the question of how Swamp Man came by it, which seems somewhat anomalously fortuitous. Uh, so, so I thought that maybe what we were being torn with is what to make of that anomalous fortune and uh, since we make so much of having acquired information in a fitting way, uh, 
But there's another idea that Terry and I have used that I feel inclined to reach for here. Uh, it was the idea that, um, that he and I talked about as um, transglobal reliability, the idea of having in play processes that would work in a wide range of worlds. And one thing you can certainly say about Swamp Man in this envisioned case is that Swamp Man would engage in epistemically productive, reliable processes uh, going forward and would, if, if I'm any good, then Swamp David would be parallel good at refining those expectations and sensibilities. And I, I feel pulled by that. Now, I think Terry may want to say more about the phenomenology. Uh, so I'm, I'm thinking there might be parallel um, lines of thought with a similar approval of Swamp Man to be given. Um, I don't know if Terry wants to say something. Maybe I'll say a couple quick things. Um, in the long term, uh, David and I have found ourselves um, sometimes seeming to start in different places and moving toward each other. Way back when, you know, we wrote our, I think our first joint paper in this, in this history was Iceberg Epistemology. We gave it jointly at the University of Mississippi, and we only realized afterwards, after Q&A and after discussion over dinner, that we'd been perceiving our own project in a somewhat different way. David was looking at it from the point of view of reliabilism about justification. I was looking at it from the point of view of what you could call experiential evidentialism about justification. So we're driving back to Memphis and David's driving and he says, well, why don't you like reliabilism? And I started talking about the brain in the vat and how unreliable his perceptual beliefs are and how evidentially justified they are. And, um, you know, we came together uh, defending a, for, a nuanced form of reliabilism that we called translobal reliabilism that would accommodate the brain in the vat because the beliefs are reliable. Belief forming processes are reliable over a wide range of epistemically possible environments compatible with your experience, right? So you're not just talking about reliability in the actual environment you're in. But there's been this underlying issue about the extent to which we want to embrace some kind of experiential evidentialism. I've, I've always been drawn that way, which draws me toward the evidential essential, the, the essential role of um, your own experience. Um, now, the Swamp Man case that we describe is one where <laughs> these themes are sort of coming together again, you know? Well, your confident reliability is a phenomenology or your confident familiarity phenomenology is as of you're having had plenty of um, experiential justification over the course of your own history, much of which you don't now remember, you haven't archived it and you don't, you don't need to have archived it, right? Um, that's the phenomenology. Question, is that good enough? <laughs> or do you need to have actually had such a history of experience in order to be adequately justified? Speaking for myself, I'm, I'm pulled somewhat both ways. And, and so the footnotes reference to the possible contextuality of assessments of epistemic justification was also part of my thinking. So, you know, David and I, we've, we've started, we've tended to start in somewhat different places, but we're always um, moving to the, moving to common ground. I'll just say that. Yeah, I did want to, I did want to add that. Um, so I'm supposing that one's um, phenomenal state in a moment might only um, 
partially reflect <clears throat> one's the course of one's phenomenological or evidential states. Um, so uh, to pick up on a point which I've pushed with Terry and I think he appreciates uh, quite well, uh, as quick, quickly, was uh, if you take the example of the Moulin Rouge and you say, well, the painting portrays uh, uh, light falling on the various figures in the painting, to what extent does it portray exactly the lighting sources? Could those lighting sources be uh, somewhat differential? Could it be uh, a certain time of the evening where there was exterior illumination, as it were, uh, that was coming through colored windows or uh, and going off certain surfaces. And there, you can imagine various sources of that same lighting. And similarly, you could imagine various sources of the same episodic phenomenal state. And so, uh, you could imagine Swamp Man having an exact phenomenal parallel to, uh, let's say, Terry, who, who as an epistemic agent I greatly appreciate uh, at, that, at that time, but wasn't a dynamical duplicate of Terry so that what Swamp Man would do, or with that illumination episodically coming out of that would be very quickly different. And you kind of wonder, well, with, with that failure of competence in Swamp Man at T, even though at T there are phenomenological duplicates, uh, does that matter? Uh, so insofar as you can get the same phenomenological uh, state in Swamp Man or Swamp Terry and Terry, but different competences in Swamp Terry and Terry, doesn't that make a difference. Now that isn't exactly that what was imagined in the case, but that's another way of pushing on is there something more than the momentary phenomenological state of the agent. Um, and okay. Um, okay, so uh, Deb Tolufson has a question. Hey David, thank you for that. Um, and Terry, your remarks were helpful too. I, I had a question, but I want to keep on the on the Swamp Man case. Wouldn't somebody like um, Greco say, "Look, uh, the difference between Swamp Man and you is that knowledge we can't credit the Swamp Man with anything, right? He he's just. I mean, you you said it initially. It's kind of luck by luck." that he turned up with the same stuff that you had as a duplicate. Whereas, I mean, what matters is the kind of history that you can, you can credit to the subject because those are competencies which they acquired over, you know, the course of their epistemic lives. And it was, it was not easy, right? It was an achievement. So I think the, the virtue I mean, why you, you might be confused about the Swamp Man is you might think, well, there is something to th thinking of knowledge as a kind of credit concept, right? That it's, it's about uh, achieving a certain competency and you don't get that, um, you know, out of, out of nothing. Yeah, I think there's something kind of interesting about making too much of the history 
And um, so I guess that's what I was pointing to in a way, but you bring out another aspect of it. Uh, so if it, I take it that if it, if, if it's Swamp Terry, who I think is a, a, a virtuous epistemic agent, uh, and Swamp Terry has a phenomenal state responsive to certain episodic inputs, uh, I'm inclined to not worry too much about the acquisition of that virtue. I don't know whether virtue can be uh, created as well as earned. <laughs> uh, so I'm more I'm more concerned with what the profile of that cognitive virtue in Swamp Terry is. If it's really Swamp Terry and a duplicate of Swamp Terry, then I see Swamp Terry or a duplicate of Terry, then uh, I see Swamp Terry as having the same competence. Uh, but maybe I'm being too nicey nice, uh, you know. Uh, but I'll, I, the one thing I often have said to Terry about just this kind at this moment is, you know, I'd be happy to have Swamp Terry in my epistemic community. Uh, I'd be almost as happy as having Terry in my epistemic community. I know Terry will be jealous, of course, but uh, because I'm, I really think of our epistemic norms and sensibilities as suited to the, the life together as epistemic agents in an interdependent community. And let's face it, Swamp Terry's as good as Terry on that front, if he's really Swamp Terry. Uh, on the other hand, if it's Swamp Trump that just happens strangely to have a phenomenological state uh, that is the duplicate of Terry at time T, uh, hard to imagine, but you know, maybe Terry's been drinking, you know, I, I've seen it happen. Uh, then I could see, uh, then I, I have a different view. So then I'm keen on competence and something like virtue. But for purposes of my norms, I'm really more interested in the profile of the cognitive processes than I am uh, on, with the profile of, um, of the history of it. Uh, but I'm sure that's a partial difference with John Greco. Yeah. Okay, thanks. I, could I add something quick here? Uh, another thought that's worth injecting here is the idea about evidence of evidence being evidence. And the reason it's worth injecting is that, you know, if Swamp, Swamp Terry's got this feeling of familiarity as of um, the confidence and testimony being grounded in a good diachronic experiential history of my own, even though I don't have any such history because I just came into being. Well, I don't have that first order evidence because, you know, I don't have a history. I don't have that first order diachronic evidence. But the current here and now um, confident familiarity aspect is still evidence of evidence. And so depending on how, how much weight you put on that, you could maybe even um, accommodate the thought that um, I'm not just lucky, I'm acting on my here and now evidence of evidence that I possess even though I lack the first order evidence. But that's just another another element of this whole story. Good, thank you. Uh, any other questions? Well, if there's not any others, I have one more. Go um, ahead, yeah. <laughs> do we have time or am I stopping people from drinking? 
Uh, you, you have time, and I, I might have a clarificatory question after after yours. Okay. Well, do you want to? Now, go ahead. Your question is okay. going to be better. All right. Than mine. Okay, so um, I really like this view, and like you know, people like me who are familiar with this debate between the reductionists and anti-reductionists, I just think your view is just a nice solution to the problems. Um, one of the motivations, though, for um, reductionism is the the child case, and I think actually you your account handles that really nicely, and you point to the Tomasello um, literature, um, but also I don't know if you if you I'm sure you know this stuff uh, by Melissa Koenig, um, where she's looking at um, toddlers' ability to distinguish between um, uh, adults that are lying or, or telling the truth on the basis of, uh, you know, that they're, they're shown, for instance, um, you know, the adult will do something uh, misleading or lying, and then later on they can be shown like they don't trust that. So they're clearly, clearly in the, in the uh, toddler case monitoring, and I would say at the level you're talking about, um, truth tellers and distinguishing between truth tellers and, and those who don't. But I wonder about the infant case. Like, is it on your view? Um, what, how is the, the competency gets started? Like, do you, do you think there are innate like stuff? Like the infant comes with certain innate monitoring capacities? Or do you think because the infants got nothing, right? Presumably, and so they just have to trust. Or do you think the infant comes with something so that already the infant is able to kind of sense or something? I don't know, what do you think about the infant? Uh, incompetent little bozo, no. Uh, <laughs> what I think about the infant, infant is that I, I, I don't know exactly what to think, but I have some clues. Uh, by the way, I don't. I know some of Koenig's, but if you would send me that uh, some references, I would like to know if I know enough of it. Uh, my thought here does go to the Tomasello, uh, you know, uh, informative healthfulness among children, uh, and it's pretty clear that. Uh, at one and a half, children turn out to be some somewhat nuanced in their, and certainly pretty good at informative helpfulness. So there's the the stuff where you you have a a, a stooge who's manipulating two things in the room at the desk in equal amount. They're very scrupulous. The stooge gets up and leaves. You got a child playing in the room with a pretty. Um, uh, engrossing toy. Uh, the um, the um, uh, stooge comes back in to the desk. One, one of the things they've been doing is stapling. He picks up a, some paper and starts looking around. And in the meantime, those, those, the two things, the stapler and this other thing, had been moved to separate parts of the room. The child breaks off uh, playing with the toy, uh, sometimes so young as to be pre-linguistic, and points to where the stapler is uh, in a si significant incident uh, preference over the other thing, uh, that suggests the child is actually tracking what the, in some sense, what the other was engaged with, and noting this combination of things so as to informatively help. And children tend to be quite informatively helpful and they become more nuanced, maybe sadly, in their helpfulness uh, by the time they're four. But it also suggests they're less, um, they're also less trusting um, by that time. So ch children, are beginning to be um, somewhat, they, they picked up something in that interval. And I suspect that there's something 
innate that makes for that tendency to pick it up. In fact, I'm sure. Otherwise, the apes would do it, and they don't. Uh, but uh, I'm, so I, I guess I, I'm not sure that competence at 11 months is a, a, a different um, sort of demand than competence at four and competence at 16 and then competence at 25. And those seem to be significant uh, biomarkers, if you want, for, for those matters of s sophistication with testimony. Um, that's just to throw some things out there. It's, and also to explain why it is that I, I don't quite know. Um, I, what, what counts at a good swing at a, ba at a baseball? Uh, <laughs> at uh, four. I mean, th those guys are chumps. I use guys in a gender neutral sense. Uh, those people, <laughs> I always wanted to say, those people, anyway, uh, are chumps. Uh, but there's some that I count as competent for their age and some that I perhaps don't. And uh, I wanted, I think I want to do something similar epistemically. I want to add a little bit. It's not actually about children. But it, and it'll speak to some of what Bronwyn said about things, things that in linguistic behavior that aren't exactly just sayings. Uh, this has to do with uh, tone of voice when you say something as opposed to just the saying itself. It involves a former member of the philosophy department in Memphis. Uh, long before the time of, I think, virtually anybody, or literally anybody who's now in that department, long ago. But early in my time in Memphis, this person who will remain unnamed would sometimes say things to me about what's going on in the university with a certain tone of voice. And the tone of voice conveyed utter, utter mastery of the information at hand and conveyed you know, excellent evidential backing for it. And I found myself believing it immediately and without the slightest doubt, primarily because of the tone of voice with which the saying was deployed. And then I learned through experience that whenever this unnamed person said something in that tone of voice, they didn't know what the fuck they were talking about. I was there when David Hiley was there. Oh my God! <laughs> it wasn't David Hiley. It was I, I oh. <laughs> answered the telephone when I, Hoke. Hoke. I one year in my one year as chair of the department. I answered the telephone, and the person on the other end said, "Could I speak to Dr. Hawley?" And I said, "Who, Dr. Hawley?" I said, "We don't have a Dr. Hawley in our department." And then this person said, "Dr. David Hawley," and I realized, "Oh, oh." This is somebody from Arkansas, <laughs> David Hawley. Yes. I've already started drinking. Maybe you can tell. Yeah. <laughs> well, since I turned off internet at my home, I have to come in to the office, so I don't have any beer to drink. Oh, what a shame. What do you feel for me? David, I, I just want a quick question about um, the swamp swamp man example, uh, and I just wanted to make sure I was parsing uh, one of the sentences right here. So um, let's see. So I just added that to the chat where you say when swamp man encounters a human interlocutor and forms the situation specific expectation that this person is a reliable source of testimony. Is is this the swamp man is forming the belief that the that a human interlocutor is the reliable source of testimony yes yes yeah. so, so I'm, not, I'm not sure I, I understand this swampman then because um so when david when davidson sort of made up this example and he talks about how swampman goes in and uh appears to i think if i remember the example it's been years like recognize his wife uh he says he doesn't 
recognize her because he's never cognized her in the first place. So if it's not only, um, it wouldn't seem Swamp Man would have any intentional states whatsoever. So, so I guess I'm wondering, what, what do you mean by them forming an expectation that a person is a reliable source of testimony? I think both Terry and I do think that Swamp Man has uh, the kind of content that is associated uh, with um, seeing the other as a reliable source. That I, That's why I went to Swamp Terry and just a, a momentary phenomenological duplicate uh, Swamp Bozo. And, um, and the idea was Swamp Terry and Swamp Bozo could have, could be exact momentary phenomenological duplicates. It's possible uh, where, it, but Swamp Terry would be as competent and nuanced and virtuous as Terry, such as that is. And Swamp Bozo wouldn't. And that was my way of worrying a little bit about the status of the momentary phenomenological state as itself, of itself, straightforwardly um, dispository with respect to uh, epistemic justification. But I don't go all the way to then not having. Um, Swamp Terry uh, lacking in so um, because I, if it's actually if it's an actual duplicate of Terry, I'm enough of a determinist, uh, which is to say quite a determinist, to suppose that Swamp Terry would do every damn thing Terry would uh, going forward. Uh, looking for different evidence, uh, being sensitive to other information. Uh, but that's going forward. And um, now, anyway. I mean, okay, maybe this is my confusion then. So, so I can see giving, you know, if I turn into Dennett for a moment, I can see myself giving an interpretation of Swamp Terry's behaviors that I could describe as, as intentional. But if, if we're accepting that, um, that phenomenology and intentionality are identical and there's nothing representational about Swamp Terry, um, how, could, how could we sort of say that? I mean, there's a couple questions there. One is how could, how could Swamp Terry have any expectations given that he doesn't have any intentional states? The other is if Swamp Terry isn't representing anything because he's made out of swamp gases um, and the phenomenology and the intentionality are identical, then it would seem that they'd have to have different phenomenology too. Well, I, as an as a exact physical duplicate, an exact duplicate of a normal human being, or even yeah. an abnormal, but especially virtuous human being like Terry Horgan, mm -hmm. uh, I, would, I would think that isn't made out of swamp gases, but made up of flesh and blood. Uh, and, uh, but I take it the central point that you're raising is uh, what kind of content uh, does a newly created swamp terry have? Yeah. And I was supposing that there's some range of content that is the same across terry and swamp terry. Uh, so in that, I think I'm on the same page as Terry is, uh, and so he could he can run with this because you know he, he knows how to talk that language. Uh, well, he doesn't have to if he doesn't want to because it is uh, six oh. minutes over. Um, so so uh, maybe on that note, it uh, we should thank. Uh, David Henderson and Terry Horgan and Bronwyn for uh, the talk and comments. Yes. And uh, okay. that, that concludes the, the 
I guess, the non-drinking portion of the, of the conference, um, although that's been violated by a few of us probably already. 